Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues uh, in our world today. Uh, I'm Princeton Junior Tiger Gal. Uh, here with me is my friend Arjamani. He is joining me all the way from California. Uh, th thanks so much for being here, Arjun. Happy to be here as always, Tiger. And, and Arjun and I today, we're going to dive into some tough questions uh, on the ethics, uh, moral philosophy, uh, the ethical moral frameworks around the coronavirus uh, crisis. You know, we, we've been doing some interviews on, on interviewing economists, epidemiologists, uh, journalists about this topic, but uh, there is one person, one important voice that we also think we should capture is, is Professor Peter Singer. He's a very distinguished professor of bioethics at Princeton, uh, associated with the, the philosophy department and also Center for Human Values and all kinds of programs. And he has been uh, somewhat of a contrarian in many uh, of his sort of philosophical career, but also a very insightful person uh, looking at issues when it comes to ethics and moral philosophy. You know, his, uh, his class, I think, was practical ethics uh, is taught twice a year in Princeton and is one of the most popular classes uh, in, in Princeton. So it's, it's a great honor for Arjun and I to have this following 30 minute conversation with him on his recent writings on the issue, uh, especially when it comes to triage, when it comes to deciding who to live and die in some of those very tough moments, whether there could you know, potentially be developed a algorithm that helps us make some of those life and death decisions, uh, some of the issues related to the economy. Should we shut down the economy or should we uh, try to save lives, which might actually generate, quote unquote, a smaller amount of utility than uh, keeping the economy running and having some of those people die. So those are very tough questions and uh, Arjun and I are very happy to present you with the following interview. Please enjoy. So, uh, Professor Singer, why don't we just uh, jump right in? Uh, what are some of the most pressing philosophical challenges that are sort of being posed right now by coronavirus? I know you've written uh, articles, you're getting a lot of sort of media requests these days. So, so obviously there's plenty to talk about, but what do you think are the, some of the most urgent ones? So the most uh, obvious one, and it is quite urgent, is that uh, the coronavirus pandemic raises the question of triage. That is, uh, do we have more patients than we can treat? Um, and if so, how do we select who we will treat? Um, this has certainly happened in Italy. Uh, from some of the reports you get in the United States, it is happening in the US and other suggestions say, well, it if it's not happening yet, it will be happening as, as the number of cases continues to increase. Uh, there's a shortage in particular of uh, ventilators and patients with coronavirus uh, disease do often the most severely affected need ventilators. So you have that question. You have um, more patients whose lives could be saved by putting them on a ventilator than uh, you have ventilators. And this is, uh, an example of a kind of question that bioethicists have been talking about for a very long time. Uh, I've myself taught it uh, in classes with healthcare professionals as, as hypotheticals often, um, but they recognize that sometimes it does happen even in normal day-to-day -day practices that their intensive care units are full and more patients are arriving. There's been some, uh, you know, a bus crash or something with lots of patients and particularly if you're in a rural area, you could send patients to another hospital, but they might die in transit, it takes time. So these are well-known questions. Uh, and in normal medical practice, the rule is essentially uh, first come, first served. So if you come into the emergency room, you need a ventilator, uh, you need a bed in the ICU, they'll do that. And the fact that somebody else comes in later who maybe has better prospects of survival doesn't mean that they take you off and put that person on. Uh, normally, you know, what they would try and do is to ring around, find another hospital that has an ICU bed, something of that sort. Um, or they would, you know, they would somehow try to manage to cope. But if you have a lot of patients in this situation, uh, then you really can't. And I don't think first come, first served is a good principle. It's, it's, it's a kind of a lottery, you could say. You know, it's a lottery that depends on what time you go into the emergency room. Um, and uh, lotteries are not the best way for deciding how to use scarce healthcare resources because some people uh, will benefit from them much more or have a much higher probability of benefiting from them than others. So uh, 
that could be because the person's underlying health conditions mean that they're unlikely to survive even on a ventilator. Um, it does give them a greater chance of surviving, but it's still a small chance. Whereas someone else, you can be very confident they will survive. They're a young, healthy person. They only have a temporary need for the ventilator. So it seems better to put the person with a bigger chance of survival on the ventilator. Also, the person who will need the ventilator for a shorter time, because then you can get them offered and use it for someone else. And I think life expectancy um, ought to play a significant role here too. So I think in general, you ought to favor younger people over older people. The uh, COVID-19 particularly is killing people, well, essentially in my age bracket, I'm over 70, but even more those who are over 80 um, and those with underlying health conditions as well. So I think you have to take that into account. If someone is over 80, let's say their life expectancy is clearly smaller than that of somebody uh, over 40, let's say in their 40s. Um, so I think you ought to give preference to people who, where you're likely to save more years of life rather than just lives. Uh, that's, that's one of the big issues that people are talking about. The other issue I should mention, which is uh, you know, a larger issue is the issue about the lockdown. Um, the lockdown is clearly a trade-off between saving more lives and putting more people out of work and damaging the economy in other ways. And uh, those trade-offs are very difficult. How do, you, how do you get a common unit to compare putting tens of millions of people out of work with saving, let's say, tens of thousands of lives? Um, you know, is, is somebody losing their job and all the hardship that that entails? Um, do, do you weigh that as, as equivalent to one thousandth of a saving a life um, or less than that or more than that? Uh, essentially, that's what we're trying to do when we're saying, is the lockdown worth it? Or now that every pretty much every country is, is into lockdown, uh, I saw even Sweden is considering this, which has been one of the last holdouts among affluent countries of not having a full lockdown. Um, so how long should the lockdown last? Um, when do we start to release the brakes to allow people to go, some people anyway, to go back to work? Uh, again, that might increase the risk of infection spreading, <clears throat> but it would create a lot of benefits as well. So uh, I, that's, that's a deep philosophical question. Uh, my suggestion is we try to get more empirical data. We try to work out the effect on general well-being of the lockdown, of, of the unemployment, of the social isolation. Uh, is it causing mental illness, more depression and so on. Uh, President Trump suggested it would cause more suicides. Is that true? Um, all of those things need to need to be weighed up. Um, and that's perhaps one of the biggest issues that we're talking about. That's a fantastic summary, Professor Singer. Um, and I think let's maybe dive into the issue of, of triage, with, which as you um, described is extremely complex and an extremely uh, painful issue to have to deal with right now. Um, so just to understand the complexity, you kind of touched on it, but let's say we had maybe a single ventilator and two patients. Um, you said one principle would be if one patient has a greater chance of survival, you would favor that patient. Um, can you just walk us through in a little bit more detail, like how, what are the different factors that go into making a decision when you have two patients on ventilator? Let's say they're equally sick. Like what, what really do you have to consider and how personally would you weigh all the different factors that seem to, to matter? Yeah, so there's there's a question as to suppose that you were, uh, and what's sometimes called an ideal observer, but philosophers. So an ideal observer would be someone who is neutral and in, in detached, not uh, in any kind of uh, connection with one or other of the patients, and fully informed. Um, and it's not so hard to be not connected to the patients, but it's very hard to be fully informed. It's impossible. Um, but uh, then that's one question, what do, would you decide? And the second question is, what rules should doctors follow given that they're not ideal observers because they can't be fully informed? So um, I think if you were fully informed, you would take into account uh, a whole range of things, including um, things specific to the health and prospects of the patient, that is uh, life expectancy, probability of survival with and without the ventilator, quality of life does the patient have underlying conditions that mean that their life is not going to be that great anyway um, you know they'll be still quite ill um, 
or are they going to be recover and be healthy? Uh, you would take those things into account, but you would also take into account things like, um, does this person have dependent children? Um, is there going to be a great hardship to the children or to the family uh, if this person dies? Um, and and you know, arrange, and you might also consider, at least in some cases, is this person going to be able to help the community a lot if they survive? Is this person a healthcare professional who will be able to go back to work with a certain measure of immunity even and play an important role in dealing with the crisis? Um, but I think that's a little too much of a burden to put on on healthcare professionals in this situation. So. I would sort of suggest as a rough rule, they should go by life expectancy. Um, how many years do you think this person is likely to survive, to live if they're treated? Uh, and that mostly would mean you treat uh, younger people rather than older people. But if there was a young person who also had a, a, a serious and possibly terminal underlying condition, so you had a younger person who had cancer and the doctors had said, you're probably only gonna live um, six months to a year, then you wouldn't give that younger person preference over somebody who was, let's say, 70 and healthy and could well live for 10 or 15 years. Um, so given the complexity of this decision, it seems like, you know, it, it makes sense to sort of simplify the decision making process as much as possible for the healthcare professionals. Um, so do you think that it's possible to sort of um, write a kind of rules based algorithm that automatically does triage? So as you suggested, kind of like, um, this one might compute life expectancy and, and use that with maybe weighting something like quality of life much lower or, or, or something of the sort. But it, in order to sort of completely take away the burden from the healthcare professionals, there's sort of a, a computer system that says we should take this person off, put this person on. Can we sort of completely automate the system or is there some softness, some bendability that's required that, that needs humans in the loop? Uh, I don't think that humans are indispensable in the loop, but the problems are all going to come into those weightings that you mentioned. And uh, humans are going to differ as to how to perform those weightings. So maybe what you'd really need to do, and probably, well, obviously this should have been done before the, the crisis struck, is have a lot of people really try to essentially form form focus groups of informed people, give them lots of information, try to work out what weightings they would put on different qualities of life, try to get them really good information. So for example, we know that when uh, healthy people judge the condition of people with certain disabilities, uh, they tend to think those disabilities are worse and the quality of life must be lower than when you ask the people with the disabilities themselves. So you would want, to, you would want them to have the information at least uh, about how people with certain disabilities rate their lives before you uh, allow healthy people without those disabilities to decide the weighting. Uh, so there would be a, a lot of things that you could and should do like that. And then maybe you could get not exactly a consensus, but anyway, a, a sort of average or median um, as to what weightings you would give and then you could plug the algorithm in and you could say, well, individuals will certainly disagree with this algorithm in various cases, but that's just because they're on one side or the other of the, of the midpoint of the different range of opinions. And um, since these opinions were well informed, well considered and so on, uh, it's reasonable to go with the algorithm rather than with the individual healthcare professional's judgment. Uh, Professor Singer, so the title of your article had the word, um, you know, hypothetical in it, which is you know, ethical decisions about who to live and who to die may not be hypothetical anymore. It, it seems to suggest that previously in medical practices, those kind of questions about triage, things like that, uh, are not sort of being posed as urgently or on a global scale as today. So this kind of forces us to confront those scenarios. But, but do you foresee uh, medical, as the crisis sort of dies down, do, do you foresee there to be permanent alterations to the medical, medical practices down the road in terms of how people think about issues like triage or? or um... Well, what I hope is that people will um, be less inclined simply to follow first come first served. Um, and uh, that they will through, because of this crisis, they will realize that there are other situations too where we should give preference to those with better prospects, better life expectancy, shorter use of the likely use of the scarce resource. Um, 
So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that it does lead to a more open and explicit discussion about the existence of rationing, uh, the way it works, particularly in the United States, um, uh, where it hasn't been acknowledged as openly as in some other countries like the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and that will lead to a bit more honesty in the discussion of how we allocate healthcare resources. Uh, do, do you have any other thoughts? I, I, I know, I, I got, actually, I was once at a dinner discussion with you on uh, brain death and, and issues sort of related to that. And sometimes I guess you tend to adopt a more utilitarianist sort of uh, perspective to look at some of those things. So do you think when it comes to, you know, on other decisions like deciding life and death rather than just triaging, um, do, do you have any predictions regarding how the conversations could be shifted? I'm not sure that, uh, that that this crisis will have an effect on discussions about brain death. Um, that's a little bit further away. It relates to views about the sanctity of human life versus the quality of human life. It, it takes a bit of a more fundamental rethink about what is it to have a living human being and what is it that we ought to value about the life of a human being. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's going to come out of this particular crisis. I mean, this crisis is not going to produce a lot of people in uh, persistent vegetative states or brain dead or long-term unconsciousness. Doesn't seem like like that's what's happening. So no, I think that's a separate issue. Yeah, I guess what I was saying is just how it sort of might affect the the, the medical community in general. And I think yeah, you 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 address some of those concerns already. Uh, maybe I think we we could pivot a little bit to. The economy, because you kind of uh, juxtapose this uh, sort of this, uh, I guess, dissonance in terms of uh, how some people want to keep the economy going and just save jobs, and some people kind of recognize how in order to sacrifice, in order to save lives, you have to sacrifice the economy. Uh, so I, I would love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on on the debate on the economic shutdown, um, where the sort of utilitarianism come, comes into the play. Um, and 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 how you view those issues? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I think in a way many people would think about that question in a utilitarian way. Uh, and I, I suppose the the what's contrary, what would be contrary to a utilitarian way would be for people to say every life is of infinite value. We can't do anything that um, causes a life to be lost, no matter what the cost. That's, that's a piece of rhetoric that you do occasionally come across. I don't think many people who really sit down and think about that would take it very seriously. Uh, because if that were the case, then we would think that our governments ought to only spend in areas where they're saving lives um, and not spend anything in other areas that are not saving lives. So, you know, whatever, whatever that might be, I mean, you could try and stretch some things and you could say, well, education does save lives. So, you know, maybe it does in the long run, but you know, things like uh, protecting wilderness, um, national parks and so on, we spend money on those things. Uh, does that save lives? Hard, hard to say how it does. So anybody who thinks that we should spend uh, a dime on those things seems to be saying saving lives is not infinitely value. It doesn't that way everything uh so I, I think that 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 kind of rhetoric is is not one that emerges from a reflection at all uh and therefore most people would be in a prepared to say you know yes there must be a trade-off at some point um that if we're really going to make let's say you know, the whole population unemployed uh existing on you know basically sunk down to the lowest levels of poverty uh, existing on bread and water uh, and not much else um, and we were doing that because if we didn't do that then there would be an extra hundred people across the united states who would die i think probably most people would say that's too high pr higher price to pay uh, ev even if you assume that you know, that there would be more lives lost by that so so then uh, there is that element of trade-off uh, and the question just is really how you make the values, which means people are already thinking somewhat inside a utilitarian framework. Uh, and the question rather is, or I should say maybe a consequentialist framework that is broadly they're looking at the consequences, 
maybe they're not only looking at the consequences for happiness and, and misery, which is what a utilitarian would do, um, or well-being in some sense. But uh, yeah, so the question is essentially, what are, the, what are the values you're trying to maximize and how are you going to do the empirical work, which will tell you to what extent those values are maximized by uh, either continuing the lockdown or easing the lockdown. Many people also present the argument that this is sort of a false dichotomy right now, since there are plenty of things that governments can do to mitigate the economic damage, for example, the stimulus that the U.S. passed. Um, and given the fact that if the economy is reopened, then uh, we might have an overwhelming of our hospital system, more long-term damage to the economy, possibly. Um, do you think that the false dichotomy argument is sound um, and that the current course of action is valid given that the risk and the potential for long-term damage is very high if we don't take the kind of drastic action that we have taken or taken right now? Yeah, I think there, I don't think it's a false trade-off. I think there is a real trade-off because uh, recessions, although um, recessions may not immediately lead to a higher death rate um, during the recession, they do reduce the size of the economy and that means they'll do things like reduce the amount of money that the economy has to spend on on healthcare, spend on training healthcare professionals, setting up hospitals and so on, and people will die because of that. The other thing that, that's really important that we shouldn't forget in talking about this is uh, this pandemic is not only affecting affluent nations. And in uh, developing nations, uh, the effect of the lockdown will cause deaths clearly. Um, it'll cause deaths from poverty and hunger. Uh, it will accentuate, uh, accelerate those, those deaths which are already occurring in small children and families that will get poorer. Will the children will become less well nourished and they will die? Um, so, I think that uh, if you if you include low income countries, then it's pretty clear that there is a trade off between the lockdown in terms of uh, more more deaths occurring. If you arguably more deaths occurring through the lockdown than would have occurred through the disease. Um, it's that's very hard to calculate. There is a paper by uh, Paul Fritas, uh, an economist. Uh, he actually, on, on his figures, which which have been criticised because he has a very low fatality uh, infection fatality fatality rate for COVID nineteen, um, but on his figures, the lockdown is going to cause seventy times as many deaths in the long run as the virus would have caused. Now, as I say, maybe those estimates are completely wrong, but are they wrong by a factor of 70? Um, it's not impossible that they are, of course, but uh, you know, if, even if they're wrong by a factor of 70, that still suggests that the, the costs and benefits are equally balanced. Um, so it's still an open question. You would have to think that he's clearly off by a larger factor than 70 to say, well, no, it's obvious that the lockdown is justified. So it, it does sound that you uh, sound like you have some skepticism about the severity of measures that have been taken. Um, and it is, there is some evidence that maybe the death rate for COVID-19 is not as high as, as reported because of individuals being asymptomatic. So um, uh, do you have a personal opinion? I, I, I know it's, it's difficult to, to say, but do you have a personal opinion about whether maybe, let's say, even if we take the U.S., an affluent country, have they gone too far? Um, have we taken too drastic measures that will have uh, long-term negative effects? Do you have... You no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't think I'm expert enough to come in on that. Um, I think that that's, that's you know, requires more expertise, both in the health field itself and in the damage, long-term damage that the economy is going to sustain. Uh, so I, I really can't, uh, I think it would be wrong of me to express an opinion on that. Uh, but, you know, put it this way, assume that these measures, well, anyway, the measures are in place now, whether they were justified or not. Um, there is a question of how long we, they should continue. That's already been discussed. Uh, President Trump at one stage said they weren't wouldn't last past Easter. Now I think they're clear they're lasting till the end of April. Um, but some people are saying they're going to take six months or more. In fact, you know, the Australian Prime Minister, where I am, uh, has said uh, expect six months. Um, so is that too much? Um, and again, it, I guess it depends a little bit on what kind of lockdown you're talking about, because there are stricter and less strict ones. But uh, uh, 
yeah, those are the those are the debates that we need to have. And essentially, what I'm saying is, we need to try to get more information. We need to look at the all of the the variables and and try to get good information about all of the costs and benefits. Uh, and and one of those important factors is, as you just said, um, how how lethal is the virus? Uh, and we don't really know that yet. Partly oh. we don't because there hasn't been enough testing done of people who are not symptomatic. Well, Professor Singer, I, I think, I suppose the, the coronavirus poses a very unique challenge in the sense that, you know, as you mentioned, older people have a way higher fatality rate than younger people. And I think this poses a pretty unique ethical challenge in the sense that in order to save a portion of society who are more likely to get infected or die from this disease, the rest of society should really kind of sacrifice and have social solidarity and come together to, to help out. Uh, so, so do you think, you know, you, you've written quite extensively about, you know, the lives you can save, the, our obligations to others and things like that. Uh, so, so do you, how do you see your philosophy kind of place into this? How, how do you see the, the issue of, you know, even, even though you, from a utilitarian perspective, from a utility perspective, uh, it might have a greater cost to shut down an entire economy than uh, letting a couple people die but we still step in to help those people and, and bring that social solidarity forward uh, do, do you see an ethical dilemma there uh yes there certainly is and actually what you said reminded me that i should slightly correct what i just said about paul frieda's uh, assessment he wasn't talking about lives saved he was talking about life years saved um so it's very relevant to these calculations that COVID 19 kills mostly older people um he quotes, for example, the figures that from Italy, uh, I'm not sure if they're still current, but his figure was that the average age of somebody dying from coronavirus in Italy was 79.5 years. Um, and many of them had underlying health conditions. So he estimated that each of those deaths uh, cost three life years, right? Whereas obviously the death of somebody who was 30 would cost 50 or more life years if they were otherwise healthy. Um, so that's a big factor to take into account. And I think that does apply here because uh, if we're comparing the deaths that would occur from COVID-19 with some of the deaths that are occurring anyway, um, the deaths of children from malaria that could be very cheaply prevented by distributing bed nets uh, uh, or, or you know, a variety of other conditions that cause younger people to die. Uh, I think that uh, you know, we're very focused on COVID-19. It is a serious threat. It is killing people. But it's, we're very focused on it because it's killing us, basically, you know, affluent people living in, uh, in affluent countries. Um, if, it was, if it were only killing um, people in low-income countries, we'd be much less focused on it because there are these diseases that are killing many more people than die from, than so far anyway, have died from COVID-19. Um, and they've been going on for, for decades and people have not been doing enough to save those lives. Um, and uh, in a sense, in that sense, COVID-19 is a distraction from the good work that many organizations have been doing, um, saving larger numbers of lives in low-income countries. Just to transition a little bit uh, and talking about wet markets. So you've co called for the closing of wet markets um, in, in, and one reason would be to prevent future pandemics. Uh, and, and China, I think, initially shut down wet markets, but now they're reopening. Um, and I think there's a, there are a few other reasons that you bring up why wet markets are in particular uh, um, pose moral dilemmas. Uh, and so I was just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about wet markets and, and, and why they pose these dangers and, and why you believe they should be shut down. Sure. And, and first, in case there's some people who are not familiar with the term, uh, a, wet, a wet market is a market at which there are live animals sold, um, usually they're sold in cages, and the consumer goes along and says, I'll have that one. Then they're hauled out of the cages um, and they're killed on the spot. They you know, have a throat cut or whatever. Um, so uh, it's an area where there's a lot of different species of animals mixed together. Um, they're crowded, uh, their feces are all around the floor, and then when they're slaughtered, of course, their blood is all around the place as well. Um, so this is um, clearly a horrendous place for the animals themselves, um, but it's also uh, an ideal environment for the spread of viruses, development of viruses. Uh, and the general view is that 
the COVID-19 uh, virus originated or spread to animal to sorry spread to humans from wild animals in the Wuhan uh, wet market, uh, possibly pangolins. Um, don't quite know, but uh, so so there's a specific risk with with wild animals introducing new viruses, but there is clearly a risk with wet markets in general um, because of the uh, animals mixing there and, and the unhygienic conditions there. So yes, uh, I've called uh, for wet markets to be prohibited everywhere. Um, and it was very interesting to see just the other day that uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Fauci of, uh, of uh, the Center for Disease Control um, uh, agreed with that um, on, on a, I think it was an interview on Fox um, uh, and said that he also supported that. So it's, it's good to get this eminent medical opinion acknowledging the health, global health risks and saying they should be shut down. And uh, I'd like to see a kind of international coalition of um, different organizations, public health groups, no doubt uh, animal welfare organizations would join, um, saying that this there should be a worldwide ban. But, but Professor Singer, a sort of an immediate question I would have is that what doesn't that go against certain people's sort of claim of freedom of, of saying, oh, this, this is my right or, or choice to do certain things such as trade or eat uh, certain products. And, and I guess in this case, surely in, the co in, in this context, and in the context of wet markets, we should probably shut them down. But what if the government uh, starts uh, making other decisions that are that will yield greater utility in general and are for the benefit of the public, but are quote unquote against uh, you know certain people's choices or freedom? Such as, uh, I, I think it's totally reasonable if if the government comes out of this crisis and say, in the future flu seasons, everybody should be compelled to wear masks in public. And that would drastically decrease the number of people that will suffer from flu, but wouldn't that intervene from people's health choices? Well, I think, you know, because health is an issue where people, especially when we're talking about contagious diseases, where people uh, actually pose risks to others, I think it's reasonable for governments to make those restrictions on people's health choices. And, and that's in fact what's happening. And, you know, going back to your earlier question of, will there be other flow through effects from the COVID-19 crisis, maybe one of them will be an end to this uh, idea of, you know, individual freedom includes my freedom to pose uh, a risk to you. Uh, because the government obviously is shutting down uh, social gatherings of, of various kinds, and that's affecting people's health choices. Uh, if people say, you know, well, why shouldn't I go and party? Um, uh, we're now saying, no, you shouldn't, um, because you will, spread the virus and, and harm others, uh, even to the extent of, um, uh, and you know, I say even particularly in the United States situation of uh, some states, I think most states now actually prohibiting uh, church and, and uh, synagogue and mosque gather, uh, gatherings, the religious, religious gatherings of all kind. Um, I think some states have not, but, uh, but some states are, and maybe that would be challenged in terms of the uh, First Amendment, but, um, uh, I would hope the challenge would be rejected if it is, because I do think that in emergency situations like this, governments are right to uh, stop people uh, spreading viruses that uh, are posing a serious risk to others. But what about in non-crisis times, such as the example of me saying, you know, everybody should wear masks during flu season? Th that's a public health Concerned. Yeah, it doesn't seem to so. Be that's the, I mean, I but in terms of rights, I think that because you put your argument in terms of my right to do what I want, I think I think the, the the crisis shows that there is not an absolute right, that the right is relative to the risk you're posing, and so then you would need to discuss how great is the risk in a normal flu season? Is it justified to impose this restriction of getting people to wear masks? Um, uh, and you know that's a debate that that's a judgment call that could go either way but it, it the rejection of it can no longer be based on the idea that I have an absolute right to do what I want even if I'm posing a risk of infection to others it does seem that if everybody went vegetarian uh, there would be much less <laughs> of a risk of, of pandemics and I know you you are a generally vegetarian and, and vegan yourself and and um, you wrote a very influential book uh, called Animal Liberation, which um, became in many ways the heart of, of the modern vegetarian vegan movement. And uh, so I'm curious whether, whether what your thoughts are about, um, is this another point in favor of vegetarianism? 
by the idea. Yeah, I think it definitely is. And it goes beyond the wet markets. Um, it, it points specific, particularly, I think, to uh, against factory farming as well, because we're focused on, on COVID-19 because that seems to have come out of wet markets. But uh, if we look at other um, pandemics and epidemics, uh, they've often come out of factory farms. Uh, so the swine flu epidemic, which, or pandemic actually was the last pandemic in 2009, um, which we didn't take that much notice of in, in the United States or other affluent countries, because most of the people who died from it died in, in low income countries in Asia. Um, but in fact, it, it killed far more people than have so far been killed by uh, COVID-19. Um, the, the CDC estimates it killed between 150,000 and 575,000 people. So um, we still have a long way to go and I hope we don't um, get to the point, certainly not to that upper limit with COVID-19. But that um, is believed to have come out of a North Carolina uh, intensive pig farm, um, a factory farm. And uh, the, um, uh, the, there was an avian influenza outbreak, uh, um, particular one that that also came out of um i think came out of a southeast asian poultry farm maybe a thai one or something i can't remember exactly the details but um yeah the, this these are also ideal breeding circumstances for new viruses or viruses to mutate and spread rapidly because you've got tens of thousands of animals in a confined space um often uh, immune systems weakened by crowding so uh it's it's another source of pandemics and, and so yes it does add uh, another reason i think you know we already had um concern for animals we already have concern for climate change uh for many people it's a concern for their own individual health now we have a fourth reason to uh, try to prevent future pandemics right i know we have a limited amount of your time if you can get two more quick questions um sure and yeah. uh so so one of them is, is i think we kind of touched on this but um do you anticipate um, this crisis changing uh, the sort of philosophical and moral consciousness of the world in the long term? Like, do you think that it could cause us to realize our interconnectedness, become more empathetic, care more about other people? I mean, in many ways, social distancing itself is kind of a utilitarian act in order to benefit people. And so do you feel like maybe this might move the world more towards um, a utilitarian philosophy or at least a more uh, consideration for a wider moral and ethical consciousness beyond uh, your own? Yeah, you know, we, we're we always tempted to look for silver linings behind the dark clouds. Um, and that's one that uh, I've, I've heard people suggest. Uh, I honestly don't know. I, I can't predict the future. I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical uh, that I, I think the, 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 the forces that produce the kind of less community oriented attitudes that we've had um, prior to this uh, crisis, are going to reassert themselves and it won't be easy to maintain the broader sense of, of concern for everybody that's come out of this. Uh, and, and just one last question for you, uh, since the name of our show is, is Policy Punchline, uh, we always ask our guests at the very end, sort of what's the punchline here, you know, whether it's for the ethical issues related to this, uh, this crisis or the future of philosophical discussions and more ethical frameworks down the road. Uh, what, what do you think is the punchline that, that people should take away from this? Uh, I think the punchline is um, try to think through what's the right thing to do. Um, don't necessarily just accept the conventional wisdom, but try and get all of the relevant information and uh, assess what's the right thing to do on the basis of, of what will have the best consequences. Uh, that, that sounds like a very optimistic and, and very hopeful message for for anybody to take away that, that's that's awesome yeah thank Good. thank you so much for taking the time professor singer we, we, we sincerely hope that we didn't took, take too much of your time and, and you're all staying safe in australia yeah certainly trying to and uh yeah no that was fine as far as the time is concerned we're, we're okay with that good uh so send me a link when uh, you put this out and i'll um, i'll be happy to share it of course. I, I hope you liked the discussion. I hope it wasn't yeah, yeah, too... Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah, awesome. Very good. Good set of questions. Good. Okay. <laughs> Thank Stay you so much. both of you too. Good. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. All right, Arjun. So, so we just got off the interview with, with Professor Singer. What, what do you think? How, how'd you like it? Well, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I agree with what he's saying. I think um, the discussion brings up a lot of 
or it brought up a lot of um, very thorny ethical dilemmas. Uh, I think triage is a, is a, is a um, you know, it, it, it sounds like a very interesting ethical dilemma to kind of discuss over, over a, a fireside chat, but now that it's, it's become so real and actualized in such a painful way, uh, how do you actually make these decisions and how do you translate these ethical questions into practice? And, and I think he did a, a great job of kind of addressing how might you like algorithmize this or, or make this a, a, a process that doctors can follow easily. Um, so that was interesting. And then I think the discussions about the economy, the discussions about wet markets, they were all interesting. Um, and so overall, I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, anything you, you think you would disagree with them on? Um, honestly, I didn't disagree with him on, uh, on too much. I, I, I generally agreed what he was saying. Um, I'm curious whether, whether you have anything, uh, whether that was a leading question. I think there's some, something really interesting that, that he said about uh, hospitals or, or, or uh, it was just on top of my mind. I kind of forgot it right now, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just think that when it comes to decisions on public health, right, especially the ones where we talked about when you compel people to wear masks in, in, in the future, uh, just sort of in public during flu season. Wouldn't, my question is, wouldn't that just follow the logic of coronavirus? You should just do that. It, even though the risk doesn't seem to be as high as coronavirus. Right. Um, so, so I think the, the, where you draw the line, I mean, philosophy is all about saying it's difficult to draw the line. So I honestly don't know where to draw the line for that. And, and I obviously brought up the case of just like, coca-cola with you <laughs> like why shouldn't we shut down like coca-cola or or any sort of you know quote-unquote public health concerns because yeah. surely you could argue that for something like coca-cola the fact that you are drinking it aren't really you know uh, directly posing a health threat to other people but in case you get sick or something you are still burdening the overall healthcare system one could make the argument that it would yeah be I, more, I mean one could make that argument more I, I responsible think, to right right i mean one can one can make the argument that your choices in, in many different contexts uh, affect uh, more than yourself, right? Um, but I do think that the example of Coca-Cola may not be as, as compelling, but I, I, do, I do like the example of the flu, right? Where that's something where um, clearly you pose a public health risk as somebody who has the flu and it's not through your fault that you get the flu, right? So, so I think the, the idea of agency here is, is obviously important. Um, so when it comes to the flu, I think the difference that has to be made is, is not about um, whether you have the agency to uh, or, or full control over whether you get the flu or coronavirus. Obviously, that in, in both cases, you don't. Um, but in the case of the flu, we are reasonably confident. Uh, and by reasonably, I mean pretty much 100% confident that the flu is not going to wipe out um, the entire human race, right, in uh, in a, in a single fall. Um, and it's probably not going to cause massive social, political, and economic damage. Um, and so when it comes to something like COVID-19, where there's so much uncertainty, um, and when the potential for massive social, political, and economic extinction, or at least damage, is, uh, is non-zero, right? When you have the probability of a non-zero probability of such a tragic and, and, and massive scale event, um, then it seems prudent to uh, enact the kind of measures that the government enacts. Um, so I would say that if it happens that COVID-19 doesn't really go away, but we become immune to it, um, we, it just becomes a part of the, the vaccine package that we, that we have to take every fall, just like H1N1 became a part of the flu package. Um, if that becomes the case, then I, I don't see that we necessarily have to require people to wear masks. I understand the case for it, but. I think that the reason that we're taking such drastic measures is because you have what, you know, the sort of a process with a fat tail where, where, the, where the tail is the probability of, of, a, of a massive like extinction or, or a massive damage to the human race. Um, so I think it, it, it is rational to mitigate that and do all things necessary. Well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I was just sort of reading a lot about whether we should wear masks, right? Because previously, uh, a lot of people have come on saying, oh, don't wear the mask, don't worry about it, uh, because uh, it doesn't actually pre prevent you from getting sick because you still breathe in things. It would only prevent you from spreading it to other people. But then only sort of recently did we kind of realize about the asymptomatic tra transmission part, 
in a sense, how dangerous it is to still spreading things around, even though you might not, know, even though you feel like you don't have it. So I, so I think, uh, you know, the CDC kind of came out this past weekend, basically told everybody, everybody is recommending the public to wear masks, but for a healthy person, that uh, incentive just doesn't seem to be there, right? Um, so, you know, I was just sort of on a run today, th this morning in Washington, D.C., and nobody's wearing masks in public. So uh, you, you, you could say that in that case, there has to be a government action in the sense that we compel you to wear a mask. So even though you don't see the, your effect on other people, uh, we have to do that. So I don't know. And, and China is actually talking about uh, um, taking, I, taking people that are confirmed to test positive but are asymptomatic, but still take them into a centralized facility. So that's, that, that gives another question. Would that be justified? Uh, because right. they, are, they would still be spreading it to other people, obviously, but they're not getting sick. So why would you just congregate them? So, um, so that's another question. I do think that what you just said brings up an interesting question in, in another dimension, which is that, you know, China has the capability to do these kinds of things that the U S um, does not because of certain, um, I guess, certain values of, of freedom that we, that we consider, like, for example, requiring exactly. people to wear masks. I think there's sort of an instinctual reaction that that would be, an overreach and like that is yeah. sort of infringing on my freedom um I, it was an interesting discussion i had with 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 uh with somebody previously where they said that the u.s has always had this kind of libertarian streak uh when it comes to like values of freedom being important in a way that they actually are are not important in other societies <laughs> we we really value freedom you know in in to like the the maximum possible degree um and, uh, and I think that's an interesting point because uh, that trickles down and when it comes to something like a pandemic, um, yes, I think that affects your ability to deal with the pandemic effectively, right? And it's not just, it's kind of more subtle than just short-term measures. So when it comes to wearing masks, you might say, okay, well, the US, because it loves freedom so much, will not do things like that, that China would, would obviously do, right? So when it comes to short-term measures, but also when it comes to long-term things, right? When it comes to like, fact that the u.s public health system uh was not prepared to deal with the crisis right that may actually be a symptom of our larger uh lack of faith with state to deal with problems of welfare of the population um Absolutely. and our and our kind of over reliance on 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 private companies and individuals to solve the, uh, the country's problems and when it comes to something like a pandemic it's just i mean all those things are invalidated right um, I remember I was reading an article by, by Professor Keith Whittington on can you be a libertarian during a pandemic? Yeah. Um, and he was just sort of like trying to figure out how you could be a libertarian during a pandemic. But I think a pandemic invalidates libertarianism as an effective tool of governance. So, yeah, I was just about to email him for an interview request. So, so <laughs> yeah, we'll, maybe, maybe we should do it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so see, it's very interesting about the, the, the part of you saying trusting, uh, uh, trusting the government because because you know especially when it comes to healthcare you know I talked to uh, sort of May who who is a, a, a senior researcher and lecturer at Princeton uh, her husband is Professor Wu Wei Reinhardt who used who sort of she and her husband basically built Taiwan's uh, healthcare system from from the beginning and she's like a true health health expert in in that sense and she was saying how you know Taiwan has this kind of centralized database on everybody's medical records and everything and and so when you go check in and check out things are easier. And, you know, I was interviewing uh, Professor um, Sherry Gleed, who, who was sort of the former uh, Assistant Secretary of Health for Obama. And she was saying, when I heard that idea, she, that there's no way Americans would agree on that. To put everybody's medical records in one government centralized database, they've, you would have chills in your bones, you know, like nobody would do that. And so that's the first dimension, which is the distrust of the federal government. The second dimension I would add on to your thing is the, the part about social solidarity, right? The U.S. has never sort of cultivated this, this thing of, you know, uh, healthcare is a human right or, or, you know, rich people and, and poor people really need to come together. You know, if I see a homeless person, it's not his fault or whatever. It's rather we should help. Them. So there's not a sort of a cultural sense or agreement, uh, a consensus on those issues. So when it comes to issues like today, when you say young people have to make sacrifices for old people, rich people have to make sacrifices for, for poor people and, and vice versa and things like that. The, the, the Americans are not used to that. 
uh, because there is no social society or tra traditionally for for decades, you know. So uh, to really bring people together in this in this crisis is just absurdly hard. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, <laughs> and I think that 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 kind of gets to why, you know, I mean, I I do think the U.S. It, social distancing makes sense, right? I, I I totally think these measures are necessary, but I also think. Um, I've heard a lot of, read a lot of articles saying that it's, uh, it's kind of a hammer um, and what we really need is a scalpel. Uh, we need a more fine grained instrument for trying to yeah. address this pandemic. And what that really means is like aggressive quarantining of those who are infected, contact tracing and massive testing, right? And the US has basically failed in all three counts. Um, and you look at a lot of other, <laughs> uh, you look at a lot of other countries, right? Like South Korea, like, the, I mean, South Korea is a, is a massive model testing. example of, of yeah, massive testing, quarantining, contact tracing, all those things, and, and, and you, you, you know, you're able to succeed. Obviously, the U.S. has a much larger population. Um, it's, not as, it's not as easy, but at the same time, uh, one has to question uh, if, this, if this sort of abates in the summer, as some people are thinking that it will, and then maybe it comes back in the fall, uh, we should be prepared in other ways than just sort of having to go back to this blunt instrument of social distancing. Right. Um, because suppression, suppression strategy, as, as you would say. Yeah. Yeah. So, inst well, instead of instead of suppression, right, exactly, we, we or instead of instead of like blanket suppression, we we are a lot smarter about making sure that those who have the symptoms and, and are sick are, are quarantined and like doing testing at a massive scale. Um, and there are a lot of things that if that if that works. Right. And so an, another thing that comes up in my mind is I read an article about antibody testing. Um, so if we are able to find the antibodies that uh, are created in, 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 in an immune response to the coronavirus. Testing for those antibodies, it's a standard practice. It's the kind of thing that you can uh, even do at home. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple practice, um, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, I'll qualify that statement. But uh, as a result, I think that if it, that kind of test was available and you, we found out that you were immune to the coronavirus, um, then you could kind of go about your daily tasks. You could kind of go about doing what you want to do and potentially help like, be in situations where you're helping people who are uh, infected be in those infection zones. So I think there are so many things we can do to make this a much more efficient process. And in fact, the reason that we are looking at like maybe three, four months of social distancing rather than the two months that it took China um, or the two months that it took South Korea or even less uh, in order to, to, to kind of flatten the curve and, and get over the hump is because we don't have all these other fine grained instruments that actually should be used in order to combat a pandemic and in many ways are more effective than what we're doing right now. Uh, I, I really like how, uh, you know, before the interview, we were talking about, we were going over the questions and you kind of mentioned this idea of false dichotomy, you know, between the, the, the sort of economic, economic shutdown and, and saving the healthcare system and things like that, which you, you, we often sort of see it as a less interesting question. But I, I feel like Professor Singer really did a good, great job sort of pinning down how much of an economic challenge there, there could actually be. Um, but but I, I really don't know in terms of on, on that front how, how to do that. I think based on the, the interviews I've done so far in terms of talking to economists and, and stuff, people genuinely agree with the current method as being taken and, and really believe, as you said, you should do the suppression mitigation strategy and then have the government sort of um, st stimulus package later. Uh, but but I, I don't know on that front whether, whether you know, after talking to, to Professor Singer, whether that's still uh, the valid strategy. Right. Um, yeah, so, so just to clarify, right, so suppression and mitigation, as we, as we see it, are kind of two different strategies for, for approaching the crisis. And, and so mitigation still says, so suppression is what we're doing right now. Mitigation still says, like, you know, we'll, we'll still, people who are sick, we quarantine them, we take preventive measures, but overall, we don't shut things down. And the goal is, is to develop a herd immunity um, to the virus. Uh, and I think the UK was initially considering that yeah. strategy, or at least some version of it, and then they kind of backed down and went, and went with suppression. Um, and their prime think, minister got it, dude. That's absurd. Yeah, that's yeah. He's, he's. I think he. I heard that he's been hospitalized now. Um, dude, I, yeah. He he just got taken to the hospital today, and I was. I was yeah. So my Chinese friends were joking. They were like, "You see China, right? All those government officials protected themselves so well. Not a single government right. official got it. <laughs> <laughs> and this place like UK, like, what? What do you mean? Someone in the royal family got it? The, the prime minister yeah. got it? Like, what are you guys right. doing? 
What are you gonna <laughs> like? <laughs> the top has fallen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, continue. Um, oh, my bad. Yeah. No, I, I. But but to your point, right? I think that uh, Professor Singer brought up an interesting question, which was like, what is the what is the real damage that is created if we sort of let things go completely, right? If we pursue like a mitigation strategy, then like, what is the real? I mean, because I know you brought up a paper which. Uh, has argued that the the long term economic cost of doing nothing uh, is worse. Is, is worse, right? Um, and I don't know if that's true, right? I think I think Professor Singer obviously is very cautious about uh, giving a, 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 a definitive opinion on the crisis, but he seemed to say like uh, it's possible that the death rate is a lot lower uh, than what is being currently reported because currently the the numbers is like ten times the flu, like one percent or point nine percent or something like that, and and it seems that it, it may actually be much lower, in which case there are a lot of questions about um, is, would this pandemic really create long-term economic damage comparable to the long-term economic damage that will be created by, by the measures that we're taking right now? Um, and I think that's a question to be, to be considered, not to question the measures that have been taken right now, which I agree with, but to question what should be done in the fall if we have a resurgence of the virus. So I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I, I think it's just really interesting how uh, there are two ways you could look at this quote unquote asymptomatic phenomenon, right? Because some people could say, oh, because there's asymptomatic uh, transmission and the infectious rate is actually, infectious rate is actually much higher, whereas the fatality rate is actually much lower. Because of that, uh, we should really shut down the economy right now because we don't know enough about this and this thing could really get out of hand. And there's another side who says, oh, because of that, precisely because the infectious rate is high, but the fatality rate is low, we should not shut down the economy. So you, you, there, there are two strands of arguments based on the precise same set of facts. I, I think that's really that's the first interesting that I kind of noted in this debate. And the second thing, going back to your question about um, how, what, when we should, whether and when we should adopt certain strategy, um, it, it does seem to me that the key concern is that there's not enough IC units and, and hospital beds in the US so that let's say this is not that acute of a disease, but so many people got it and they all rushed to the hospital, it will completely overburden the healthcare system. So I, I think it is more for that concern per se, rather than the concern that if everybody got it on the streets, they're going to screw everything up. Um, so, so I think uh, uh, today, a lot of the, the economists are, are pre precisely concerned uh, with, with the part about uh, ICU units and hospital beds I, I, in terms of whether this could overburden the healthcare system. Um, because, and, and, and also this is actually one other thing I want to uh, bring up before turning over to you. Um, so the director of the Center for Disease Dynamics and Economic and Policy in the U.S., so the, the director, his name is Ramanan uh, Lakshmi Narayan, is an Indian guy, and, and he gave a webinar talk, and he said, in, in a place like India, uh, on, a, on a normal year, if things just go smoothly, 8 million people would die. And the projection in India right now is that in the worst case scenario, probably, uh, 2 million people would die from coronavirus. And he said, if you actually think about it, if you have two extra million of people dying in a place like India, you spread it out you know, over the course of a year, it's not going to be that acute of a, of a you know, challenge to the, to the healthcare system. Whereas in a place like the US or in a developed country where you don't have that many people dying in the first place on an average year, and suddenly you have hundreds and thousands of people dying in one particular hospital every day, the psychological effect and the, the, the acute overburdening of the healthcare system, that's what's going to actually push the thing over. Um, well, he, he's not saying that, therefore, we should ignore India's case or something like that. But that is also the, sort of the, the ratio and the number that we should keep in mind, which is very interesting. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know so much about in India's situation, but I would be immediately skeptical of that. And, and I do think that the lockdown right now that's in India, there's a 21 day, day lockdown. And so like my, my grandparents, my, a lot of my family is just, they're completely locked down, not leaving the house. Um, similar to, similar to us, basically. Um, but it's, it's in many ways a preemptive lockdown, right? I don't think that the cases to my knowledge are, are at, are so bad in India, right? Right. But 
But the whole idea is that if it uh, got bad, it would get really bad, right? And so what does that, what does that mean is that um, the healthcare um, that is provided currently in India will not have the ability to deal with this kind of surge, right? So the reason Absolutely. that- yeah. The reason that you would see, like, you would see, we have, let's say, let's say that like 0.5% of people in the U.S. die of it, right? After, after contracting it, right? Um, those, the people who died probably had better access to healthcare, right? Um, and so it stands to reason than, than somebody uh, in, in India, right? And so it stands to reason that there were probably people who did not die in the U.S. healthcare system probably would have would. died if they were living somewhere in in a rural area and they Much, didn't have good yeah. access to healthcare in India, right? So, so I mean, the healthcare system in, in cities is, is, is pretty good in India, by my experience. Of course, that's not the most qualified statement. But, but again, when you have so many people living in, in slum locations and rural areas and the quality of healthcare is not so good, you might see a significantly higher death rate, right, than you'll, than you'll see in, in, in a country like the U.S., um, and so that's why I'm not sure about those, those numbers. Um, and obviously I think yeah, it would be question much the easier. Experts, uh, of course, well, yeah. I mean, just, just question your, the experts based on your own feeling. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those no, are no, really no. good arguments. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I do have to say that those are, everybody says this, this these days Those are very tough questions to answer, you know? Of course. Of course. Um, but, but incredibly I, tough incredibly tough. I uh, see. I'm glad people are, are, are looking at those issues uh, in a more kind of um, fact-based way than, than before. And, and I, but I, I do, but I do think in the initial response at least, and hopefully we'll do some more interviews on the media side of things and the communication side of things. Uh, if we look at the history of how misinformation was spread in the, in the onset of this crisis and how even, you know, very famous uh, TV broadcasters and, you know, even the president himself and certain government officials and congressmen come out to mock the fact that, you know, this, this thing is so overblown. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, it's it just the communication failures and the, the media have not sort of played a facilitative role in that regard. And, and Twitter and things like that have just completely not helped this, this case. Um, and, and we'll actually do an interview with Melissa Reynolds, Dr. Melissa Reynolds, who is a, a postdoc at Princeton. She wrote this Washington Post op-ed basically saying communications failures could, could lead to very dramatic uh, consequences. And I think, you know, since you worked in Google and tech, and I think that this might just be a thing that we can wrap this up on, is that uh, it, it, with a platform like Twitter, right, with a platform like, like Facebook, the potential consequences of misinformation spreading and um, you, everybody kind of go against their own way of saying, oh, I want to challenge the expert. You know, you have 100 pe people challenging one expert. Then that expert is going to get overwhelmed and tired and he's not going to respond anymore. And, and, and that's how things just get out of control. And, and if, if you ask around your friends and none of your friends are wearing masks and the Twitter that you scroll through seems that nobody is wearing masks, then you, you'd say, ah, then that's not that big of a deal. And, and that creates this kind of, you know, quote unquote, social discourse that is very bad so so i don't know i i I've, yeah no i think that's a great i think that's a great point um i think that like coronavirus misinformation is is has been a, a a big issue and continues to be a big issue and um uh i do think that in in these kind of extraordinary times it it, it makes sense for like i think facebook and twitter often say that they're a platform right they're not they're not a public and so you know we have a there's a limit to how much we can regulate content. And I think that that limit should be softened and, 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 and um, more regulation should happen in, in these kind of times where misinformation can have potentially deadly effects. Uh, I know one case is like the campaign against Dr. Fauci, like he's been getting debt threats and, and a lot of that, uh, <laughs> yeah. a lot of that originated <laughs> yeah. on, uh, on, on, on social media platforms, right? Where there was this kind of campaign of hate against him because he seemed to be directly contradicting the president. And these kind of things are, are, are obviously, toxic dangerous and and um uh and 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 i think facebook and twitter have a responsibility in these times to prevent these kind of things from happening that's what um, i'm saying arjun break those big tech giants up break them up <laughs> but yeah i mean it helps, right? we'll see, we'll see. um but uh but i i think i again as, as you said like there's also like the flip side of things where 
people who are, who are you know, self-styled coronavirus skeptics uh, are also saying, oh, well, it's the media that's actually fueled this hysteric, uh, this, this mm. sort of hysteria about the coronavirus. Um, and if the media wasn't doing this wall-to-wall coverage and, and dramatizing things, then we wouldn't think things are so bad and, 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 and then do these actions which are bad in the long term. Right? That's, that's kind of their, their opinion. Um, and so, so, yeah, there's that other side where it's like, well, yeah, the media has been covering it a lot. Um, and I think that's, I, I think that's personally a positive thing, but, but there's also the flip side that's arguing that actually the media has like overhyped it. Maybe. Um, it's hard to say, right. I think, uh, uh, the seriousness of the issue kind of throughout January and February, there was very little seriousness about the coronavirus. Um, I think, uh, the president was definitely, uh, somebody who took it less seriously in, in those months. Uh, and I think that had a huge impact on on the 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 effect that it had in the U.S. because we were not prepared, um, right? But then I, I, we kind of oscillated where suddenly we went from like um, we don't really care and and it's 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 in many ways like like there were a lot of people who use this as a subject of humor, right? When it didn't affect us, um, and now it's like suddenly this is like incredibly um, unfortunate and 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 to such a we've just magnified it to a, to a massive scale when it comes to like this crisis being potentially completely devastating to the U S and that's why we had to do all these measures. And so I, I, and I, and I qualify that by saying like, I'm more on that camp, but I do think that it's, it's interesting to see how we suddenly went from like not taking this seriously to taking it with the degree of, of seriousness that we should take it. But when mm. it was just too late to actually, uh, mitigate this crisis in a in an effective way and now we are stuck with like three or four months of social distancing and like that's what i want to get back to where it's like this is this was not inevitable it was not inevitable that we had to socially distance for three or four months like the reason is is because the u.s the really negligence up. the initial exactly. negligence. in a systematic way they they messed up and it could have been taken care of so much more efficiently and i think that brings up a whole host of interesting you know logistical and policy issues about how it should have been done more efficiently, how it can be done more efficiently now, but also a host of philosophical issues that we already touched on in this conversation, which is why was the U.S. so unprepared, right? Um, and it goes to sort of systemic issues surrounding the U.S. healthcare system and, and, and systemic philosophical issues sounding, surrounding the way that the U.S. thinks of the state um, rather than just a short-term crisis where the U.S. just happened to mess up and they could have done better. So... Wow. Wow, Arjun. I, I have to say, the Policy Punchline is not a platform for you to spread your ideological <laughs> warfare against uh, the current I'm wor- administration. I'm wor- worried about my citizenship. <laughs> 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 oh, but, but that, that was a wonderful conversation, Arjun. Uh, well, thanks so much for having this conversation with me after we Absolutely. Talked. Me Thank you. And uh, it was a good interview, huh? It was, it was very, very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Enjoyed it a lot. And, um, and, and some of those ethical questions are, are so... I think they're overlooked in this time when everybody's talking about the stimulus package and, you know, if you, yeah, yeah. And, and the modeling of diseases and, 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 but so I'm glad that we had this conversation. So thanks so much for joining me today. Um, really appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, Tiger. Thanks for having yeah. me on as always. And this concludes this episode of Policy Punchline. Uh, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, any of the platform that you can find us, um, you know, visit us on policypunchline.com slash COVID-19 for our most updated, uh, interviews and, and coverages. We, we have student writings, op-eds, uh, upcoming interviews focusing on coronavirus. We're updating two episodes per week, all giving you the most uh, frontier uh, opinions and, and ideas on, on this issue. So thank you so much for listening today and, and watching this video. Uh, take care of yourselves, everyone. See you soon. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.